Well, F1 team owner, I'm a co-owner, I have to officially say that. Ken Anderson's my partner at USF1. But yeah, here we are at Bruntingthorpe, and this is a place that will become very much a part of what we're doing and going to be doing in the future in Formula One because, as we all know, there's less testing in Formula One and, and indeed in most big categories of racing today to keep the cost down. They're limiting the testing in a way that guys like Rob Wilson, who raced back in the 70s, would never have believed. And it is an issue. It's a problem. How do young drivers get from karting, Formula BMW, Formula 3? How do you then make that true progression into Formula One? And it's a huge problem in America, of course, if you're talking American young drivers coming over to Europe to excel in Formula One in a place where there's, I don't know, 13,000 ovals or something ridiculous and 126 road courses. It's a ridiculous proportion there. So uh, to get around in answer to your question, this is an ideal way for drivers to test when they are not allowed to test on real racetracks because you're doing it with who I believe is the world's best driver coach and you're doing it in an environment in which it's very repeatable. It's not difficult to come here to Bruntingthorpe. There are wide open spaces. The Walton family are incredibly easy to deal with. You don't have to worry about a racetrack being available and then getting the marshals and all the paraphernalia you need when you're running at a proper racetrack. And then beyond that, to do it in basic road cars. And, and here today we're very lucky to have the beautiful little Arbath uh, 500s and the Punta Grande. But uh, even with a normal road car, you can simulate a lot of the problems that drivers have. I say problems because every race driver is imperfect regardless of what level they're operating, whether they're in Formula One or graduating from karting, there's still a lot to learn. It's like any athlete, athletic endeavor, any sport. And to do that in a repeatable environment in which it's cost effective, it's relatively safe. I say relatively because we're in cars and we're moving, but it is a safe environment. There's lots of runoff area. And we can do it in a situation where the driver can talk to the coach, in this case, Rob Wilson, and can listen to what he's saying. I think it is unique in that respect. There is no other way in the world you can sit down with the driver and actually touch the heart of what he's doing with the pedals, the throttle, the heel and towing, the coordination. Everything is there to see in this road car, in this environment. And it's very difficult if you were to try to transplant that with a race car into a racetrack with all the noise and everything that comes with it, actually to be able to work on little details of the students driving. And that's what's so good about this. And that's why at USF1 we're going to be adopting a very similar driver testing and training technique. Well, USF1 is a, is a project that uh, Ken Anderson, my partner, and I have been working on actually for about 15, I don't know, 20 years since we first met back in 85 at the Williams factory not far from here. Uh, Ken was working for Penske at the time, I was working for Williams. And we've always sort of kicked around the idea of doing a team in various forms. We've had a, had a go at doing a team in America at one point. Uh, and this, um, this specific F1 project started about four years ago uh, with Ken and I wondering why there was suddenly a vacancy for teams in Formula One. Uh, David Richards was sort of nominally owner of the 12th franchise, team franchise, but didn't seem to be doing much with it. Uh, and when he dropped out, nobody seemed to take his place. And that, that was amazing to us. And of course, the reason for that was that at the time, four or five years ago, everyone believed, I think the sort of general public and, and most of the racing public believed that in order to do an F1 team, you had to spend, generate and spend 250, 300 million or some ridiculous amount of money. So Ken and I just sat around in Starbucks cafes in America, wondering if we could do a team differently do it from ground zero without any of the inherent um, problems built into the team that, from another era, if you like, and looked at the technology in America in that wonderful belt now that runs down from Charlotte to uh, Atlanta. And we just went from shop to shop, from region to region, and we realized that the technology level there is at least the equal now of anything you see in the cottage industry here in, in the UK and in probably in northern Italy. Uh, and the first stake in the ground was to prove that we could design and build a, or Ken could design and build a full-scale rolling road wind tunnel that would be better than anything ever built in Europe. And it's a pretty sophisticated piece of kit to have to do. And Ken did that um, for about well under a quarter of the budget that it would have spent, would have cost to do it in Europe. It's a better tunnel than anyone's ever built in Europe. And most of the F1 teams have been there and, and agreed with that. And having put that stake in the ground, we thought, right, we've got a mega wind tunnel now. Let's, let's see if we can do a Formula One car. And, and sure enough, we put all the sums together and it looked like a really sellable proposition. 
in a way, the recession helped us because prior to the recession, when we were putting up our hands saying, look, you don't need to do a Formula One team the way the Europeans are doing it, spending all that money, most people were saying, yeah, yeah, you know, what do you know that they don't know? Um, but when the recession came, people sat up and took notice of what we were talking about, and it kind of helped us in a paradoxical way. And uh, we got some great investors. We are doing the car in America. We're racing in 2010. We got our entry. It's all pretty exciting. And, and what I'm looking forward to most of all is finding the next Lewis Hamilton in the United States. He probably doesn't even know he is the next Lewis Hamilton. We've got to find him. We've got to take him into Formula One. And I believe we could do that with something like an American version of the Grand Prix shootout. And I really hope we can do that. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing about the Grand Prix shootout. Um, what I love about the Grand Prix shootout is that it is touching the element of what our sport is all about. It's actually about wonderful, wonderfully talented drivers managing the dynamic weight of a racing car almost to perfection. I say almost to perfection because I don't believe the perfect lap or the perfect round of golf or the perfect game of tennis actually exists, but as near perfection as you can get it. And in the past, apart from the coaching system of Rob, which is repeatable, affordable, and in a great environment in which to be learning, apart from all that, I think what is great about the Grand Prix Shootout is that it gives everybody an opportunity to come face to face with the world's best driver coach and for that driver coach to relate that young driver to a database of talent that includes former world champions and maybe even a reigning world champion, who knows. Uh, and that is an invaluable, priceless commodity. And I think that's what makes this so good. You can enter the Grand Prix shootout, basically if you've got enthusiasm, talent, and you've done a bit of racing, and you can just see, have I got exactly what a Kimi Raikkonen had at this stage of his career and the database is there to be referred to but beyond that what I love about it is that anyone can enter and whereas most driver scholarships are based on a committee a grand committee of people and nobody ever really asked how that committee is defined how they got to be on the committee but they're on it anyway and they decide who the short list of drivers will be, of who those drivers will be, and, and it's a short list of eight or ten or six or typically that sort of number, and then they go down from six to three to two to one. And that's fine, but if you don't make that initial short list of ten, it doesn't really help you. What I love about, uh, what I love about this is that anybody can be a part of it, you don't have to worry about are you going to make the short list of ten, because you can be, you know for sure you're going to be evaluated the same way as the winner will be evaluated at his at preliminary stage. And if you do well enough and you're prepared to learn and listen and be self-critical and you have a physical talent as well and the right attitude, almost certainly you will succeed and that's, that's what this is going to reward and I believe it's unique in that sense and that's why we're 100% behind it because I think not only do I want to see this do well in England, I want to see it in Europe and definitely in America because that's where there is no ladder to Formula One and that's where we need this sort of thing more than perhaps any other country in the world.